Good afternoon, everybody. It is Dr. Stephen Kachikian from the Black Hills Regional Eye Institute. And today I've got um, kind of an interesting case of a, a partially uh, dislocated, inferiorly dislocated lens, likely due to weak zonules. And when I initially saw this patient in the clinic, I don't think I recognized that he had um, these loose superior, superior zonules or superior zonular loss. Um, but when I got into the operating room with a good dilation. I just don't think he was dilated enough in clinic. I was like, okay, we've got, you know, a more complex case here. And you can see the lens is a little bit loose. By the way, you can probably hear my dog in the background. He is exploring. In any event, so we put our viscoelastic in and we're going to make our main incision. And the lens is somewhat loose. It's not, you know, totally uh, loose, but those zonules clearly are weak superiorly. So initially, and I'm sorry this is a little bit out of the view, initially what we're going to do is just going to stain the anterior capsule and see how we do making our anterior capsular excess because um, I don't think there's any zonular loss. I don't get the, there's no vis or uh, vitreous that has come forward in that area. I just think that these superior zonules and possibly all of the zonules are weak, but specifically these superior zonules are weak, uh, zonules are weak because uh, the lens is shifted inferiorly. So we're going to stain with viscoelastic and we're going to see what it's like making, or we're going to stain with tripan blue, and we're going to see what it's like making our capsular excess, see how much laxity there is as we do that. In cases like this, when I stain, I like to paint the tripan blue onto the surface, and then I'll refill with viscoelastic. I try and be really um, generous with the viscoelastic in these cases, especially since uh, this one is somewhat unplanned. Usually I'd put this case kind of in, at the end of the day, but this came up right in the middle of the day, and so we just have to be... Um, really um, I'm smart with our time. So there's a little weakness there, but it looks like I'm going to be able to make my anterior capsular excess pretty easily. We want to shift it uh, slightly inferiorly because um, what we're going to do eventually in this case is like we put in a capsular tension ring, possibly a capsular tension segment, and that's going to shift our opening of our capsular excess superiorly as we do that. So we're going to make this capsular excess slightly inferior and probably slightly smaller than average, slightly smaller than average because um, I want to have a good purchase for the capsular hooks that I put in. And if you've used capsular hooks before, you know they have kind of this duck bill shape to them and they will situate themselves in the capsular fornix, which is nice. That is the advantage of them over just uh, using iris hooks to stabilize the capsule, which also uh, kind of can be done. But the, the utility of the capsular hooks is that you are able to get the kind of the hook portion all the way into the capsular fornix, and so you want to have a good anterior capsule for that. So what we'll do, and you can probably hear Solo, my dog, just breathing heavy. But anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that. What we're going to do is we're going to use um, a little bit of BSS and see what it's like. Can we rotate this lens? We definitely want to get hydrodissection and hydrodelineation both, okay? And, and the reason for that is because, one, we want to separate as much as possible the lens from the capsule so there's less or cortex from the capsule because so there's less pulling on the capsule when we do our uh, cortex removal but two if we get good hydrodelineation then we can remove the nucleus of the lens without disturbing the capsule because that hydrodelineation ring and that potential space there will create a little buffer zone a little shock absorber um, so that when we remove the majority of the nucleus we don't disturb or cause undue tension on the zonules. So what we've done is we've done a hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, and then we've put a little bit of viscoelastic in between uh, the capsule and we try and get it in between the capsule and the cortex, but I don't actually know if we got that. We just kind of can't really tell uh, surgically when you're doing it. 
And now we're going to use our capsular hooks. And you can see it's got that ductile shape. We kind of poke it in there. And then we've created the space with the viscose, and we're just going to try and get it as far back into the fornix as we can. It's always stressful during the procedure to put tension on the capsule. But that's why I have a large capsular rim and probably a smaller than average capsular rexus because it gives the capsular hook a larger area uh, to purchase as it's doing its job. And I think that the, the larger area the tension is spread out over, the less likely the hook is to damage the capsule. So we're going to put place two. We've got one superior and, at least in the view, one superior in the view, kind of one more inferior in the view. I think our side port incision is in between the two. And so again, we'll get it all the way in get a good purchase and you can see uh, the distal end of that hook gets all the way into the capsular fornix and it pulls minimal cortex with it which means our viscoelastic probably got in a relatively good position to allow um, the hook to be right up against the capsule And, you know, I don't know that that's always perfectly desirable. You might want a buffer of cortex there. The problem with that is then it makes the, it harder to get the cortex out if you need to leave the hooks in when you remove the cortex, which you may not have to do. One thing that's a little tip here is that the hook ends, and this goes for both capsular hooks and iris hooks, the hook ends can be a little bit long, right? And they can uh, bounce up against uh, the lower lid or the lid speculum. And then that, if that's happening while you're operating, that's going to cause a turbulence or movement inside the eye because the lower lid's going to be hitting on the hook. It acts like a fulcrum, and it causes turbulence inside the eye. So just clip the, um, the more proximal end of the hook that's outside the eye. Shorten it, clip it. And that will reduce the likelihood uh, that that hook will bounce up against the lower lid and will reduce the amount of turbulence inside the eye. Now we're going to put a more viscoelastic in. We'll work on doing our phaco. But there you can see it. You can see that hook being moved by the lid speculum superiorly there. And that's annoying because that causes the hook to move inside the eye. So we're going to use a uh, quadrant. We're going to remove some visco that we placed in and also enter a capsule. Now we're going to do some gentle sculpting. And I think I could have argued to not place these hooks um, before the surgery, it looks like the lens is stable enough so that if I did a gentle phaco, I could have gotten away with using either none or one capsular hook. But you don't really know that when you start. You, you just kind of, how, you, you're like, okay, is this ca how loose is this capsule and how, how much manipulation am I going to have to do the lens to get it out? Is that going to cause more tension? So you kind of, it helps to put the capsule hooks in initially, even if you're not 100% sure you need them. You know, you want to put them in in a case like this. Yeah, McCool, I think, once said, how do you know when to use capsular hooks? And his answer was, when you think about using it, it's the time to use them. So uh, that's sometimes a good rule of thumb, and that comes to mind occasionally during cases. So we've gotten half the lens out. Notice... Now, there's minimal manipulation, and most of the chopping is done without rotating the lens, especially on that first half. I try and chop. It's, it's a good consistency lens to chop, so we've got that benefit there. And I'm trying to chop the lens without rotating it. And it, it chops nicely, so um, we kind of lucked out there because they don't always do that. If it's, a, if it's a softer lens that doesn't want to chop, sometimes it's harder. But in those cases, maybe you can prolapse the lens out of the capsule. So the lens is pretty stable. We're not doing a lot of manipulation. It do, the hooks aren't moving a lot. The capsular bag isn't moving a ton, although it does look a little bit loose. And we are getting the bulk of the lens out safely. We're keeping our FACO tip central. And now we've got our nucleus out. We're going to go for our epinucleus. And you can see we've gotten some cortical cleavage to our hydrodissection there, there's cortex that wants to come out in addition to the epinucleus. You probably hear the dog making noise in the room. I apologize for that. 
but I wanted to get this case out because I came across it and um, I've been meaning to do a narrated video for some time, but it's a long case. All right, so now we're going to be smart here. We're going to put more viscoelastic in. Why are we doing that? Because we don't want the capsule to come up. We don't want it coming forward as we attempt to get out the epinucleus and the remainder of the cortex. And pretty soon here, we'll probably switch to IA. Looks like we've got a little um, fluid under the conch. Sometimes if you create a, a little bit of... Um, a little tear in the conge in that area, then it will reduce the accumulation of, of subconjunctival fluid there. All right, so this is looking good. We've got epinucleus coming out. We want to be careful. We don't want to pull capsule with it. It doesn't look like the capsule distal to the incision is too loose, but with the right amount of force, you might pull it. So you want to be careful. Okay, and it's getting to the point where I'm thinking if this big piece doesn't come out, I can't kind of just um, tear it out or inch it out. It's kind of then I'm going to switch to just plain old IA and get it out that way. It does look like it's kind of like teasing it, teasing it out just gently there. So that was good, but I can't imagine I'm going to do much more um, with the fecal probe here. It seems like it's time to time to switch to IA. Maybe we'll put a little more viscose in. There we go, a little more viscose. Great, and look at that. We, we put in the viscote and took our faker probe out. Why do we do that? Because we don't want the lens bag complex coming forward and bringing vitreous with it. It's already loose, and we don't want any more tension on there um, than need be. And so, by filling the bag with viscoelastic before we remove uh, the faker probe, that reduces the trampolining of the capsule. Now we're on cortex removal here, just gently. We've got to be gentle because, again, we don't know how loose that capsule is going to be. It looks like, inferiorly, there's pretty good zonular support. And, you know, you're, you're just really learning this throughout the case because you don't know going in. And superiorly, you know, there's some support there, and some it's provided by those. That capsule, if you look superiorly, oh, look at that. That's, there's not a lot of zonular support right up there. Do you see that? I just kind of pointed to it. I must have been talking to the technician at the time of the case. But you just superiorly in the view there, superior temporal, there it, you are pulling on the pulling on the capsule and you can see the capsular fold. So we're going to get more viscode in there to push the capsule back as we pull and use the IA to pull out the epinucleus and cortex. And again, the cortex is coming out pretty easily. We probably had a good hydrodissection, but you can see there's viscote going back there to keep the bag back. And you can see that the capsular hooks are doing their job, especially that superior one. They're doing their job keeping the fornix of the capsule back while we remove the epinucleus and the cortex. And that's really the most important thing. Inferiorly, better zonular attachment. And we're just going to slowly tease out the remaining cortex and epinucleus. And it takes as long as it takes. Uh, a torn capsule with a vitrectomy will take longer. Trust me. So we just want to take our time trying to get this material out. And for this sub-incisional stuff, it can get frustrating. You just have to be patient. You can visualize getting a good purchase on cortex or epinucleus before you start to, to pull. Sometimes you can use some BSS, you know, like a power washing maneuver. I tend to, 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 to like that and to use that maneuver quite a bit. Although I'm always more cautious when the zonules are weak. There we go. We're getting it out slowly but surely. Could consider putting a little more viscoelastic in too. Um, well, here we are. I guess that is what I do. More viscoelastic in there. Push the capsule back. Push the capsule back, grab 
the epinucleus cortical material right there. Perfect. A little bit more. A little bit more. There it is. Awesome. Okay. So now again, this go last again. I probe out. Okay, so what's next? We've got the whole lens out. The capsule is intact. We've got two capsular hooks superiorly. We're clearly going to have to put in some sort of capsular tension ring and then probably a capsular tension segment. Um, we'll see what the ring does. You know, maybe you can get away with just the capsular tension ring, but what you don't want to do is just put in a capsular tension ring, come back the next day, and figure out that your lens is so inferiorly dislocated that it's sitting in the middle of the pupil. And when the patient is lying supine, it's hard to tell exactly where that um, ILL is going to sit. So before we put on our capsular tension ring, we want to take out our capsular hooks. Why do we want to do that? Because you don't want the ring to go through that lumen, that opening in the, the hook there. So I'm going to loop. Um, these hooks are a little harder to get out through the main incision like iris hooks are, and so I tend to pull them out. I'm sorry, the hooks are a little more difficult to get out through the incision, the original incision you created, so I tend to pull them out through the main incision. Iris hooks, you can just kind of yank those out through that original incision that you created to put, put them in. But these hooks with that duckbill shape, it's more difficult. So a little manipulation, they come right out through the main incision. And in a case where you want to minimize tension on the capsule itself, I think this is a good way to do it. Because otherwise, if you try and pull them out through the original incision, you wind up catching the edge of the incision. It's not fun here. I'm trying to get the hook out without pulling the capsule with it. And you can see that's very weak there. You can see the edge of that capsule is you know, supra-nasally, um, those zonules are just not doing their job. And superiorly in general, but it's more superior nasal than anything else. So next step is a uh, capsular tension ring. And I usually put this in with the assistance of a Sinsky hook. And the reason for that is I don't like the leading um, eyelet of that capsular tension ring just shooting into the edge of the capsule. I feel like it's it's pointy or than it should be. So I use a Sinsky and the first thing that touches the fornix of the capsule then winds up being a big loop from the hook which is very blunt and very soft and very gentle and it doesn't matter if the tip of that there we go boom perfect doesn't matter if the leading edge of that um, capsule hook gets bent a little bit. No big deal. There we go. Now, look at that. That's actually pretty well centered. The capsular tension ring by itself did a really good job at centering that bag. But I honestly don't think it's going to be enough. And again, like I said, I don't. you don't want to come back the next day after... A case like this, finding out that the lens is not centered. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in one capsular tension segment. And these are just great. These capsular tension segments are excellent. So we're going to be um, a little gentle here and do some anterior capsular cleaning. Really, I just want to prevent capsular contraction that's going to dislocate this bag any further. So that's why we're doing that. So just a really gentle cleaning. And now we're going to bust out our capsular tension segment. And you want to be aware of the configuration of the capsular tension segment. Make sure you get it in the proper orientation. And sometimes it's a little hard to place. But again, it's, it's nice to have a large capsular rim as well to place it. And the way we're going to secure it is we're going to use a 6-0 proline 
and we're just going to kind of do um, a little buttonhole type maneuver by using cautery to create a little flange on uh, the 6 0 proline. So we'll start with the 6 0 proline and create a little uh, um, take off the needles. And what we're going to do in order to get it in the eye and then anchor it uh, to the sclera in the appropriate position is we're going to start with it already kind of docked in the lumen of a 27 gauge needle that's bent. We'll just get plenty of that and then we'll kind of cut it off. We're not going to make any opening in the conjunctiva other than the opening that's created by the needle. That's one of the nice parts of this te technique is you don't have to take down the conge as long as you get that flange buried uh, subconjunctivally at the end. So we load our 27 gauge needle and we're going to put it about two millimeters back and angle it between the anterior portion of the capsule and the posterior portion of the iris. And this is, you know, difficult because you don't want to puncture the capsular bag. So we want to make sure we get plenty of viscoelastic. Um, in the sulcus to allow the needle to enter without damaging any structures. So there is our viscoat in the sulcus. There's plenty of it. And since those angles are weak to begin with, you should have a good space, but still, um, you want to be careful. We want to measure appropriately. And you want the needle bent because if the needle is bent, you can more easily angle it and direct it. To the appropriate location. So we'll mark one more time, get an idea of exactly where we want that. We will go in, and then once the needle is in, we can advance the proline through the needle lumen and use some micrograspers to, to pull out the suture. We're using those calipers on the other side for a little bit of counter traction. They may not be good enough. They're a little too pointy, perhaps. We want to create a little more space there. So we don't, and there's the needle. Perfect. Perfect. It's coming out exactly where we wanted it to. And then we'll advance the suture through the lumen and grab with the micro graspers. See if we can get that, grab it. Perfect. All right. So the needle can come out gently. We've got our suture duct. Now we're going to get the capsule tension segment and make sure it's in the proper orientation that a hook there is, I don't know if you can see it in the view, but it is oriented and angled up and it's not in the same plane as the part of the, the hook that goes into the fornix. So you, and you want it to hook up and over the capsule. So if you put it in an upside down, it's not going to hook up and over the capsule very easily. So you want to go in like that, and then you want to think about how do you want the flange to sit, and I don't think it matters that much, but you should at least consider it. Do you want the flange up above or coming? I usually just have it coming from the top, and so the flange sits kind of underneath. And that's how it's oriented here. 
and that should work just fine. So we will get the capsular tension hook, or capsular tension segment rather, on the suture, the proline, in the orientation. Then we'll grab the proline the way we want it and use a little cautery to create our flange or our little button. And that's what we will use to keep the hook, I'm sorry, to keep the segment on the suture. I'm thinking about it again, how do I want this hook to be oriented? It's going to sit just like that, perfect. Place it on. Use some cautery. Create a button. Make sure the button's big enough to keep the hook. There we go. The hook's not coming off. The segment is not coming off. Now we're going to place the segment into the eye. We're going to make it a little smaller. That's okay. We're going to place the segment into the eye once we get our flange done and. Then we'll create that same little button outside the eye. And that flange or that button will ensure that the entire eye well capsule bag complex doesn't drift inferiorly over time. That's really what we want. We don't want that drifting inferiorly over time. Now I will tell you that sometimes once you get it in the eye, it's hard to get it positioned exactly where you want it. So we'll put some more uh, viscoelastics, provisc this time I think, into the capsular bag, filling out that fornix so that we can get our capsular tension segment where we want it. It is not hard to get it in the eye, but it is somewhat challenging to get it exactly where you want it. And this is a smaller bag or a smaller uh, entry capsular opening, so it may be a little challenging to get it through that opening too. But that's okay. The leading part, I think, is in the bag. It's a little hard to tell. Try and get the trailing portion in the bag. Remember, we've already got a capsular tension ring in there. This is just the segment. Now we're going to kind of pull and see if we can get it oriented properly. Now, when you pull like this, if it's not all the way seated in the fornix, it wants to verticalize. It wants to become vertical. That only makes sense. But once you get it seated properly in the fornix, then it creates that more lateral tension that you're looking for. The other thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that the eyelet is lined up with the opening made in the sclera. Because if it's not, then that's going to cause some torsional tension and that's not going to be very good. That's not really what you want. But once the ring or the segment is seated properly, then it kind of forces the tension to become more lateral and less vertical. So it kind of wants to verticalize there and you're trying to flatten it out. And the more you can get into the fornix, the less 
vertical that tension will be and the more lateral it will be and you want it lateral so you can pull the capsular bag but we're not even as far out right now as the capsular tension ring that's in there we can't even see it and so we've got some distance to go there we go now you can see the tension now is is more lateral it's pulling the capsular bag superiorly the vertical component of that is being counteracted just by the um, the majority of that ring being the fornix of the bag and that looks great so now what we're going to do is we're going to try and make it a little extra tense so we can create our flange then relax the tension and it should be well centered so overly tighten snip don't lose the end but get enough so you can create a good sized flange that's not going to go through the sclera so we're kind of overly tightening we're kind of stretching that capsular bag there you don't want the area wet it's hard to create a flange if that area is wet, so we'll use a wet to dry it. Cautery, good size flange. Under the conge, done. Looks great. That will work, that will hold that capsule superiorly for quite some time. Next, we will work on getting in our lens and then we're going to be done. I actually think this patient gets a couple of eye stents at the end, but I don't have that in the video. I'm just putting our one piece lens in the bag with the capsular tension ring and the capsular tension segment, which is anchored to the superior wall of the sclera using a proline and a flange technique brought to us by Dr. Cambrava, who really kind of popularized this technique. And it works very well. Now we use IA, clean up, get as much out from behind the lens as you can, being careful not to disturb the capsule. This patient, especially because he's getting an eye stent, which means he has some glaucoma, will get Diamox postoperatively. And we didn't disturb any vitreous, which is nice. And that's the end of the case. All right.